almost summer day. But I'm gonna feed my starter. I just pulled it out of the fridge. It's been in there maybe a week. I'm gonna feed my starter and it's about one o'clock in the afternoon. And because it's been in the fridge and our house isn't super hot, tomorrow morning it'll be good and ready and at the perfect point for me to bake bread. So in the summertime, I find a good baking schedule is to take out my starter in the afternoon, feed it. In the morning, first thing, I mix up bread dough. Mid-afternoon, I shape the dough, and then before bedtime, I bake the bread. I do this for a couple of reasons. One, it's warm enough that I can do it within one day, and doing it overnight means I need to put it in the fridge. Two, your house is at its warmest in the evening anyways. Um, the house will be starting, to, you know, at that point I can open up windows. Our house is actually stays really cool, so I don't have to worry about this. But if you have a hot house in summer, one of your options is to bake late at night because your house really isn't going to get much hotter anyways and you can open windows to cool down overnight. So, my favorite way, again, like I showed you in the video, use a funnel to keep the top of your jar cleaner. For what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump some starter into here and feed it for bread baking. And I'm just going to feed a little bit of this and put it right back in the fridge so that it's just fed and healthy waiting in there. Um, at this time of year, um, starter can get unhappy really quick because it's so warm and then add in that I'm busy in the garden and that I have a newborn baby. It just means that I've always got the insurance of this in the fridge and that makes my life a little easier. So you guys see me feed twice. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to estimate about how much starter I have here. I've only got about an ounce of starter. So I'm just going to add about an equal amount of water to what I have starter. You can always feed your starter more than its volume. It loves to grow, but you can't feed it less than its volume. If you feed it less than its volume, it will starve. So you can take a tablespoon of starter and feed it a cup of flour plus water, but you can't take a cup of starter and feed it just a tablespoon of flour. It will starve. So I add in water first because then my starter is nice and dissolved into the water. The spoon is not the best in this jar. Okay, so now I'm going to look at this to estimate. So I've got about um, three ounces. And I'm going to start with, okay, I need a different spoon. This one works better because it fits in there better. So, because I have about um, a third of a cup, I'm gonna put about a half a cup of flour in as a starting point. And my flour, I just have a big tub right here. And I use mostly organic unbleached white flour and fresh ground flour. But I just feed my starter white because it's simpler and it's right here. So I feed my starter thicker than most people. I find this way it stays double and ready to bake with longer. So this was about a half a cup of flour and it was a little thick. Um, you can see there's still dry spots and it's too thick. Like it's, it's not there. I want like a muffin batter consistency. So add a little bit more water stir it still needs a tiny bit more I just added too much flour there oh well if you add too much flour just add a bit more water okay so now it's like a thick muffin batter. So all I'm gonna do here is scrape down the sides a bit. And 
now it's gonna go back in the fridge. Now I'm gonna feed my starter for baking. So I've got just about eight ounces of starter here, which is just less than a cup. Um, so by feeding it, I'm gonna feed it about equal amounts and that will be enough for a few loaves of bread. So with that muffin batter I'm aiming for, right now I'm kind of, I'm actually, I'm pretty, this is good. This is a little on the thinner side. This is more like a pancake batter almost, eh, it's, it's muffiny. But we're gonna leave it here because if I add too much flour and water, this jar is going to um, double over. Or sorry, it's gonna bubble over. You wanna make sure that you have, um, that your starter has space to more than double. So here, I've got it at about 12 ounces, and, or just above, and that is more than enough space for this to double and not bubble over. Because when it bubble o bubbles over and is dried on the jar, it's like glue to try and get off. I just dumped flour all over my floor. So, and then the trick, if you're using a metal lid, if you put the lid on the way you would if you're canning, this will seal it, and the gases from the off gas from your starter digesting its flour and stuff can make your jar explode if you have it on too tight. So do it this side up so it's not properly sealed, so it can let those gases out, and just do it on, don't like crank it on, just like, just gently put it on. And uh, this one's gonna sit on the counter, and this one's gonna go into the fridge. So normally I'd tell you that if your starter has deviled and is falling, then it wouldn't be happy to use anymore. Good morning, Freya. But I just fed this yesterday at 7 a.m. I fed it at 1 p.m. I know it's still happy. It's not completely fallen. And I'm going to use it and it's going to be great. So maybe I'm mixing up some bread here. So for this bread, we're going to follow my basic sourdough boule recipe, which is, or boule, however you want to say it. It's on my blog and I'll link it. I have it written in my recipe book though. And I have children who are going to join me. And we are going to mix this up. So first I measure the starter in and I do so by stirring down the starter and then pouring it into a jar because measurements are always by um, they're always by the stirred down starter if you're measuring it like a cup measurement if you're weighing it it doesn't matter Okay, I actually have perfectly enough for two loaves. So, I'm gonna dump that in. Not three. Pam, do you want to get my Danish dough whisk? Not three. The one I use for mixing dough. Okay, and into here, I'm gonna add water and oil. So because I want to um, bake this today, I'm using Mom, warm not, yeah. water. Yeah, Freya, just hot second and you can start. Okay, you can start. Of 
quarter cup of olive oil. And you can use honey or sugar, but I don't feel like measuring honey right now. Well then stop putting toothpaste, toothpaste in your hair. hair. There's still a piece of it in your Tablespoon hair. of salt. And this is for what you Okay. This is for everything else. Okay, so now in here I've got sugar, salt, starter, water, oil. I'm gonna mix this up. I do have a Bosch mixer that um, I would probably be using for this, but I want to show you how easy it is to do this by hand. So mix that up. Now we're going to add flour. I do flour. So, call for three cups per loaf. One. But there is some varying factors there, and you do need to be able to... I'm measuring this. You can wait to judge your dough. Five, six. So I've got all the flour added in now, and I'm gonna stir it to combine. And we're not actually going to knead this like you would a traditional dough. Actually, no guys, you're not watching the show. You can go wake Mac up though. Okay, so we're gonna mix this just until there's pretty much no dry spots. So I've still got a little bit of a dry spot over here. So this is a firmer dough than a lot of recipes you'll see, but I find the doughs are so hard to handle that are so wet that this makes it, this is just a little easier when you're first starting out. Okay, so now we're going to leave this, cover it with a wet cloth and leave it for half an hour, and then we're gonna knead it. So my dough has been sitting, it's not gonna look any different, but it's gonna feel a lot different. So I got my hand wet and this makes it easier to handle. And you're going to move this. And you'll find like it's got a lot more stretch to it now versus before it would have been harder to knead. And you're really only gonna knead it like, let's count. I did like three, four times there. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Like, that looks just fine. There's still a few little dry bits that are from the bowl. That's fine. Now we're gonna let it sit till it's afternoon. So when I poke the dough, it doesn't bounce back. This means it's given all the rise it has to give. If it bounced back at me quickly, it needs to rise more. You can see by all these indents left that it's got no more left to give and it is time to shape this bad boy. This is one of my favorite things. helpful for getting the dough out, but also when it comes to washing the bowl, it's helpful. So, you can weigh this, or you can just guess. I'll weigh it for you just to show you how that goes. So, this in grams. This is 1045. 
and this is 920. So I'm going to give this one about 50 grams. So now they're both about a thousand grams, which is like a two and a bit pound loaf. These are big loaves. So we're going to flatten it into a rectangle about the size of my two hands. Flatten it there and then you're going to roll it up like that. And this is a bench rest. Bench rest is a 10 minute pre-shake rest that you do and this helps your dough to, um, it will make your loaves taller and that's a good thing. So while these are resting for 10 minutes, and again, this is the step that I skipped when I first started making bread. Don't skip this. This step does make a difference. If there's a step that you can skip, like kneading for eight to 10 minutes, I'll tell you, skip that. You don't need to do that. For something like this, this 10 minute rest, it makes a big difference. Shape your loaves into this pre-shape bench rest. And while they're resting, you can wash your bread bowl and get your pans ready, etc., etc. So, I'm gonna show you two ways to rise these. The first way will be like the MacGyver, you don't have any special tools. And the second way will be using a special proofing basket, which are by no means necessary, but they are fun to use and they enhance my baking experience. I was given them, I did not buy them, but I was looking to buy some. And Sourdough Schoolhouse, who I've worked with, um, she offered to send them to me. So that was really kind of her. And she was so generous. She sent me six and they're amazing. I love using them, but I'm going to show you how I did it before I had that option. So I've got some different options for you showing you what you can do. So when you shape it, you then I'm going to put it in a parchment paper sling and this will help it be easier to move around. So you can let it rest in here. Keep in mind that it's somewhat going to spread to the shape It'll stay pretty firm, but it's somewhat gonna spread to the shape of what you're using. But you can use this so that it doesn't spread too wide. Here's a metal bowl you can do for a round loaf. Here's a basket that I found at the thrift store. I used to have a pile of these, but I gave some away because like, when I got the proofing baskets. Um, someone told me these are communion baskets. But yeah, you can find baskets at thrift stores. Here's a container that you could use. Um, taller like this, is better than wider. Um, I used to have ones that were smaller, but this is just one I kept. The other option is I used to use a thing of tin foil, and when I shape and it's in the parchment sling, I'll put it the sling against the wall and then against this to help keep it propped so it doesn't spread too much. These are my actual proofing baskets. So this is the batard shape. This is one of my favorite. And this is the boule shape. So what I like about these, I will link these below for you so you can see them in her, um, the Sourdough Schoolhouse shop. So what I like about these is they are taller and they're not as so big. They make nice tall loaves. The dough doesn't spread. I like these linen liners. You can bake without the liner if you wanna have the imprint of this but only do that on a dough you're confident with if your dough is a little wetter these linen liners are really helpful it's not gonna go back on with one hand and these are floured which helps the dough not stick so okay so shaping these this is the seam side and this is the nice side so we put the seam side back up again and again we're gonna press it into a rectangle about the size of two of our hands the difference this time is instead of that roll we're going to go like this and then this is where you need to create tension which is what makes your nice tight loaf so now that I've rolled it I'm gonna tuck these edges in and then I don't put a lot of flour on my counter because I don't want my counter to be too slippery because then I can do this. I can pull it 
and create that tension some more because I want it to be nice and tight. And it's going to relax some, but that's how she looks now. So now I'm gonna put this in the parchment and I'm gonna show you how I used to do this. So I'm gonna use this method here. And I'm gonna put this right here. And I'm gonna shove that so it's there and helping it pop up. So I've squeezed it a little bit because it's going to relax and push back. So it's nice like prop there and I'm gonna lightly cover that with a wet towel as well. Same one I had on the bowl. This one, same thing, seam side up, gentle rectangle. Tucking those edges in, kind of squeeze it all together in the center. This one, though, is going to go in here. I'm going to put some extra flour on here. Get flour on the bottom. Put it in there nicely. Flour that all nice. So, I could have floured my other one, but just didn't. So now it's sitting in there nicely. You can see there's lots of space for it to rise. And um, this is gonna be beautiful. My bread is getting close to being ready to bake, so I'm showing you how I'm setting up my oven. So, you can bake on just an open pan or you can bake in a covered pot. These are both cast iron, which I prefer. Other options include, you can use a pizza stone, or for the covered pot, you can just use like this is a one gallon size stainless steel pot. Here's its lid. It's oven safe and you can bake in this as well. It works excellent. The point is that the covered pot traps the steam. But I'm going to show you the difference between baking covered and baking uncovered. Because I find if you're wanting to bake multiple loaves, baking in covered pots is trickier because to fit that many covered pots in your oven is harder. Whereas like the pizza stone, I can fit a couple loaves on that pizza stone. I can fit a cast iron pan beside the pizza stone. Um, I could do a couple racks in the oven if they're in open pot, open pans. But if they're in pots, I can only do one rack because it doesn't fit two racks. Hamish is working on sorting and folding laundry in the background there. So the bread is filling out nicely. With sourdough, you're not looking for it to double, you're looking for it to one and a half, and this is looking excellent too. I've got my oven all preheated. So again, we're gonna poke, and it doesn't instantly spring back, which means it's got all it's got to give. And um, again, we're looking for more like one and a half, not doubled. Doubled, and it will be kind of overproofed, and you run the risk of it falling and being dense. And this one was nicely supported. It didn't fall. It's still pretty tall. So now we're going to throw these in the oven. I'm going to show you scoring with a fancy scoring knife and just a good sharp bread knife. Um, these are two. So I'm going to use fancy scoring knife on the bread that I used the fancy one for. And I'm going to do it that I use the actual proofing basket for. I'm gonna do that one in the covered pot. That being like, this is what you do if you're doing all the fancy things. I'm gonna use the bread knife on the pan, so uncovered, and the one that didn't rise in a basket, so you can see, like just using what you got without having any fancy things. What's the difference? How's your bread look? Okay, so in the cast iron, I'm gonna take this loaf, Ooh, it's just about too long for yours. You're just going to fit in this 10 inch cast iron. And we're going to do... So the trick is you need to do these confidently. And this helps the dough expand. And I do fairly deep slashes here. My evening kind of got away from me and I had some phone issues. So I wasn't able to film um, like the middle process and taking the bread out of the oven. But now it's been out of the oven for like three hours now. And I'm going to show you what it looks like, as well as my tip for softer crusts. 
I moved this over to the table it was on the counter, but my trick for softer crust is this is a small wool blanket and you wrap your bread in a wool blanket and it makes your crusts so much softer. So this bread is still kind of warm because it slows down the cooling down of it. But this is my one that was in like the fancy thing with the fancy slasher and this and that um, and in the covered Dutch oven. And this is the one that um, was done in the cast iron, no basket, slashed with a bread knife. So they look significantly different. But I'm going to bet you a lot of money they look exactly the same on the inside. Excuse the fussing baby, but Marius is dealing with her, so that'll be fine. So. That looks pretty dandy, guys. I'm happy with that. That's exactly what I was aiming for there. I don't like a super open crumb because then all your butter just drips through and your peanut butter and honey drips through and the kids get ticked because it's dripping all over them. So I am super happy with that. I've never actually baked this recipe um, using the basket and such. I've been using different recipes recently. This one has a tiny bit more open crumb, but pretty much guys, like, you know, it's splitting hairs. This one's a little bit more open crumb, but they both look terrific and they're both gonna taste amazing.